For scripture reading this morning, our Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. The temptation and fall of humanity. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, Well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. And So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And so he said, Well, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Well, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of the fruit which I commanded you not to? And then the man said, Well, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply sorrow, and your pain you shall bring forth children and he shall rule over you. And then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree uh, from which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field, And in the sweat of your face you you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. And also for Adam and his wife the Lord God made tunics in and clothed them. And then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put his hand out and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. And so he drove out the man and he placed a cherubim at the east side of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Our epistle lesson this morning comes to the book of 1 Peter chapter 4. Verses 1 through 6. Christ's example to be followed. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, and lusts, and drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. 
But in regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was also preached to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to man in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Matthew's gospel, chapter 16, verses 21 through 23. Jesus predicts his death and his resurrection. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. And then Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. Here ends our reading. Well, it certainly has been a developing story now for a number of weeks, maybe months. I probably lost track. But it seems that the attention and the fear of the coronavirus has really intensified in the last week. The epidemic nowadays reminds people of the fear that was felt in the Middle Ages among the scourge called the bubonic plague. And the Black Death was rightly feared, for the historians tell us that one out of three people perished in Europe. And while the pandemic was rightly feared, and is rightly feared, centuries later, we remember it was trepidation too. Yet at the same time, we also are quite playful with it. Because you know that nursery rhyme, ring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. And it's believed that that nursery rhyme has its origin in the Black Plague. And the ashes referred to in the nursery rhyme, of course, are death. It's referring to death. But when children recite these words, that's the last thing on their minds. They're just having a little fun activity of moving around and spending some energy. So we see this combination of what a serious topic and how lighthearted it can be. Now, adults, we have a little more fear of things that can harm our body. You think of when a person who is rather aged in years, when that person dies, will have a mixed reaction to uh, in many occasions. And you've heard many things like this, probably you've said things like this. When a person who's quite old passes away, we say, and especially if the death was, you know, s- quick or sudden, we'll say, well, at least she went fast. Or sometimes you'll hear people saying, uh, well, at least that person didn't have to suffer. People find solace in the fact that the person who died quickly did not experience pain and suffering. Now, have you ever stopped to consider that people react altogether differently when a person dies quickly but happens to be younger. Even though the younger person might have also been spared the physical pain and suffering, the same relief is not expressed by everybody else. As I walked out of our church building uh, back in January after we finished our annual meeting and got in the car and turned on the radio, the first thing on the news that I heard was that Kobe Bryant had died in the helicopter crash. And I think we would assume that he and all those who were with him perished quickly because they crashed into a mountain, no possibility of survival. Yet not one person I have heard express any relief that Kobe and the others who died did so without an extended time of pain and suffering. So we compare our context, our mixed context right now of how we deal with death and how we react to it differently, whether it was from an old person or from a younger person, depending on how much pain was felt. It was quite a different reaction for folks in the Middle Ages who were believers. And in the Middle Ages, people did not want to have a quick death. They didn't want to have a sudden exit because they wanted time to confess their sins, to work out problems with others, to have time to think about uh, God and, and pray. People prayed then that their death would not be too short nor too sudden. 
Now, in some ways, we still hope and act for an extension of life. You know, many people submit themselves to the harsh effects of, you know, radiation or chemotherapy to extend your days. And while you hope and pray for good health, even in our modern, fast-paced age, the church has still not completely lost the sense of the uh, worth of contemplating death, contemplating mortality. While you do not want to be obsessed about your death or how you'll die, there is something beneficial about being mindful that you too one day shall pass from this earth. Even if you're going to live for another 70 years, there's something very spiritually mature about remembering that this life is not all that there is. It's helpful to be mindful of the grim reaper, whether his sigh sweeps away, uh, takes you in this upcoming uh, Wuhan virus, or whether you are in a car crash, or whether you have cancer, you know intellectually that you cannot duck down low enough for his sigh to miss you. And so it is that each one of us, each one of you, is confronted by your mortality. While it's important to keep this in mind, as it uh, affects everything that we say and do, of course, there also is an unhealthy fixation with death. Some people fear death so much that they never end up living. They're just trying to avoid dying. And the most famous person to experience this kind of phobia in recent decades, I suppose, if you remember hearing about Howard Hughes, who uh, would never pick up anything without having a Kleenex tissue in his hand first to avoid protracting uh, germs. And then there's the kind of fixation, like you see at extremes, like, you know, at Halloween or something, where you know, the word we call it macabre, where you know, people are uh, just, you know, in the dark all the time and maybe put on white makeup to make their faces look like they're, you know, that they're almost dead or something like that. So we, we don't want to be in that direction either. We want to live life for what it is, but we don't want to live life like that is all that there is. And it's out of this balanced respect for the living of life and for the respect of death that we as a church observe the Lenten season. Now, many churches do not have an official Lenten season or an Ash Wednesday. Even our own congregation here, we didn't have an Ash Wednesday service, but we still noted it on our calendar as being the beginning of Lent. And somebody asked me one time, she said, you know, why is it that some churches have Ash Wednesday and some don't, but it seems like almost all the churches celebrate Christ's birth and almost all the churches celebrate Christ's resurrection at Easter time, but why not every church having Ash Wednesday? And so I thought about it for a second, and the best answer that I could come up with was that, well, it really isn't remembering anything specific in the scriptures. It's not like when Jesus was conducting his ministry that he went around and made little ashes on, on people's foreheads like that. So, it, you know, it doesn't have a specific biblical reference. And, and she agreed with that assessment, too. She said, yeah, I think, that, I think that is correct. Well, whether it is correct or whether it's not, and I just had to make up something to sound uh, like I could have an answer, the idea of sackcloth and ashes is certainly found in the Old Testament, King David put on sackcloth and ashes to lament the sins that he had committed and how his transgressions had affected negatively all those around him. And even uh, Mordecai in the book of Esther, when he discovered that all the Jews would be killed, that he also put on sackcloth and ashes to avert the order that, that Haman wanted to exterminate all the Jews. Now to be sure, the practice of sackcloth and ashes have communicated the idea of repentance for thousands of years. And even in the two millennia that Ash Wednesday and Lent have been observed in the church, they have always had this same somber tone. But if you think about it, and I had never thought about this till just very recently, that the beginning of the Lenten season has a different feel than the end of the Lenten season. And here's what I mean by that. Now, of course, because there is no Lenten season in the scriptures, per se, we take scripture verses and kind of superimpose them onto the season. And there are connections indirectly to the New Testament. Like many churches, 
when they observe Palm Sunday and they put the palms away and then take them out the next year again. And then they burn those palms using them uh, to be the ashes for Ash Wednesday. And uh, you need to remember, of course, to do that ahead of time. I've heard of pastors who forgot and grabbed the palms for, you know, an hour before service or maybe 20 minutes before service and burned the palms and then the ashes were hot. And so, you know, people were uh, marked with the cross of Christ in a little more permanent way that they had wanted to be. Got to plan ahead. You know, in our tradition, we haven't practiced that kind of piety, but we uh, certainly still have observed that the Lenten season is uh, a time of uh, reflection on yourself and how uh, you need God's forgiveness for your many sins and also that you too shall one day die because of your sin. And so the culmination of the Lenten season then, it's almost like it's defined by its end and it pushes backwards. Like the Lenten season comes to its culmination, of course, with, you know, with Good Friday, with Jesus dying on the cross. But the beginning of the Lenten season is given the, the thought assigned to the beginning of the Lenten season is usually Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Now, we in our congregation, a number of weeks ago, we covered that. We talked about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. We covered it during the Epiphany season. And it's logical to think about it then, too, because uh, after Jesus was uh, baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him and drove him out right into the wilderness. So it's very Epiphany-like, too, but it also serves as the scripture that focuses our attention in beginning the Lenten season. As you remember, of course, too, that when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he was tempted for 40 days. And so the Lenten season numbers 40 days except for Sundays and the last three days of the Lenten season, the uh, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Saturday. That is not our focus for today. We're not going to talk more about the temptation of Jesus, but we certainly have a very Lenten-type scripture that was assigned for us this morning. And we heard that that short passage from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 23. And in the short selection, we hear Jesus preparing his disciples that he will one day need to leave them, and they will need to take on the work of ministry themselves. Verse 21 tells us specifically that from that time forward, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. Now here again, let's take a step back and let's think about how Christians have reacted to the thought of, of death. And we remember once again that how Christians in the Middle Ages oftentimes would pray for a long and protracted season of dying so that they could work out everything spiritually. But this was not the case with the absolute earliest of Christians because how did Peter react when Jesus said that he was going to suffer and die? Peter was upset. He rebuked his Lord for saying such a ridiculous sounding thing. You know, and I've often thought, if, if you really were following Jesus, are you really going to take Jesus to task for something? You know, it just seems so disobedient. But we can understand why he reacted so strongly. I mean, we would probably have done the same thing. I mean, first of all, they were shocked to hear such good news because this, this story that we heard today about Peter rebuking Jesus comes not too long after the transfiguration. When Jesus had taken Peter and James and John up in the mountain and he was transfigured and bleached white and then brought them back down the mountain again. So here they had beheld him in all his glory. They had seen the best of the best, the most glorious of everything. And then here we are just a few verses or chapters later and then Jesus is saying, oh, you know, I'm going to be taken away and, and suffer at the hands of the chief priests and the elders. I'm sure it just seemed like such a disconnect to Peter. But we also have to remember the disciples' reaction on a personal level. Remember that Jesus and his disciples shared everything together. They traveled together. They ate their meals together. Uh, We can only uh, assume what kind of close relationships they enjoyed. And so Peter was just reacting out of a sense of humanity and losing one of his friends and mentors. Peter was no stranger in making bold statements. When Peter said, forbid it, Lord, this should never happen to you, that is not the first time that Peter spoke strongly. 
As we remember in the scriptures too here again, right back at the transfiguration, as we thought about last Sunday, when Peter and James and John beheld Elijah and Moses flanked at one of Jesus' sides. And what was Peter's reaction? But he said, it's good, Lord, to be here. Let's build three tabernacles, you know, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He was wanting to, you know, keep that mountaintop experience going. He wanted to live in the moment. And Peter also made another bold statement when Jesus asked his disciples one time, who do you say that I am? And Peter was the one who cut straight to the chase. He said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Peter was no a stranger to making rash kinds of statements. But Peter's boldness was markedly absent when he needed to be the most bold of all. For when Jesus was arrested, what did Simon Peter do but deny his Lord three times? Peter, at that moment, understood the existential nature of his situation. This wasn't just losing his friend. This wasn't just confessing Christ in a, in a moment of clarity. Peter knew when he was denying his Lord that he was at the same time saving his own life. He understood the imminent danger. And so we can sympathize with him that it was almost sort of just like a, a form of self-defense. How do you think that you shall react when you either A, are forced to deny your Lord? We pray that that day might not come anytime soon, but you never know. The scriptures say to always be prepared, but at the same time the Spirit will be with you to give you the words to speak. Or how are you going to react when you know that death is right in front of you? And of course, it always is right in front of you in one sense. But you know what I mean. When, you're, uh, when you receive that diagnosis, when you're in that moment of danger, how are you going to react knowing that death is just as much of an option in the next moment as life? There are lots of things to be prepared for in death. There is no hiding place from the Grim Reaper. And there are many things that you can do to be prepared, and especially in our day and age, you know, we have the luxury of you can pre-plan your funeral, and you can have it paid for in advance, you can pick out all the hymns that you want to have sung, and who you want to sing at your funeral, and what uh, cemetery you're going to be buried in, or if you're going to be cremated, those kinds of decisions can be easily made. But those are not the most important decisions about death. You have to think about the most important things, not about what pictures you're going to put on your uh, picture board, that people look at when they come in for the service or, you know, what kind of slideshow projection pictures are you going to have to look at before the service starts, that kind of thing. These are not the essential questions of life and death. Jesus warned his disciples of the importance of death and his own death. And Peter, in his reaction to uh, how he responded to Christ's words also showed us the serious nature of death. And so I ask you this morning, as you think about your own life and how close or far away from death you think you are, which is something you really can't ever know, are you prepared to die? Are you ready to meet your Lord? When you meet your maker, either later today, or 70 years from now, what are you going to plead? Are you going to plead the blood of Jesus who has covered all your sins? Or do you expect to try to convince God that, you know, I was a good person and you can just let me in because it'd be the nice thing to do? You know, we were discussing recently at our Tuesday morning Bible study how it's so strange that a lot of people understand intellectually that they're going to die. I mean, nobody gets up in front of TV and says, I'm never going to die. You know, while everybody else in the rest of history has died, I'm going to be the exception to the rule. Nobody's that foolish. But there sure are a lot of people in this world who act like it. And they're just shocked, you know, when they receive that diagnosis. Well, how could this happen to me? Why should this happen to me right now? 
How could this happen to my loved one? You know, it's if, it's, it's if we have the same reaction as, as Peter, except we're not saying it about Christ, because we know the story of Christ. You know, he came 2,000 years ago and died. That was part of the plan. But we act like that for our own death. Well, forbid it, Lord. Why should this be? This should, this should never happen to me. Just like G- Peter said, this should never happen to you. Forbid it, Lord. And many people protest, and maybe you've said things like this when you were close to death's door at one time or another. Maybe you said things like, I have children and grandchildren to live for. I've got too many projects yet to finish. I haven't taken that once-in-a-lifetime vacation yet. I just retired. Well, preparing for that trip of your lifetime and preparing your will, they are indeed things that need to be uh, taken care of if you're going to do them. But the most important thing to be prepared for in life is not for any trip around the globe on a cruise, is not for how you're going to avoid that cruise because you don't want to get some type of virus, or how you're going to hide out uh, in the wilderness or in the woods to uh, avoid any human contact. That is not what thinking about death is. Thinking about death is preparing to meet your Lord and not with some type of self-righteousness and Lord, look at what a great life I did and how much I served you and how much I gave in the church and how my offering was a large. No, no, no. It's just coming with simple humility, a forgiven sinner just like Peter was. It's just coming to eternity and being prepared that when you meet your Lord, that you will have the words to say, I plead the blood of Jesus. I know I'm a sinner, but Christ died for me. That's being prepared. When you're sorry for your sin, when you ask for Christ's forgiveness right now, even before you get to the pearly gates, that's being prepared. So be prepared for that journey, whether you go to our Lord or our Lord comes first and gathers his own, whatever comes first. Amen.